Okay. All right. Yeah, before I get so just like a little pro tip before I started with the lecture. Um, so I am totally willing to talk with you before class as long as I get like five, ten minutes to set up before the class actually begins. Also willing to, to stay after and talk at, if that time is more convenient. Um, I am willing to talk solo with you like after everybody left or while everybody is here. And if you haven't thought about this, there's a bit of a trade-off to make. One trade-off is that you know, if you're talking one-on-one -on -one with the instructor, that might feel intimidating. On the other hand, if you're negotiating in front of everyone, you feel more comfortable. But then uh, I cannot um, be as flexible in some sense because if you're talking with me in front of everyone else, everyone else is watching that interaction to see what is Ben going to respond with, right? So if I let, like, oh yeah, I'll totally reward back those ten points I took off your homework. Everybody else is like, I'm coming out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> So just think of like the negotiation position. We're going to talk about negotiation tonight, but this is like the first instance that I wanted to sort of talk about is a negotiation. The context matters, right? If you're interacting with me one on one, I'm probably more willing to sort of like explain, take time, be more relaxed, right? And maybe you'll get something out of that that's different than if you're in front of you're talking in front of the entire class where everyone's paying attention. Like, how is that going? Right? And that becomes uh, something to think about. It's a trade-off. So, you know, <laughs> I've uh, put this lecture in here because getting data is usually one of the first things you need to do. So um, some of this is going to talk a little bit deeper than you may need uh, for most of your data science um, activities. But I sort of see it as relevant so that you do know more than anyone else about how to get data. So we're going to go a little bit deep today. Um, and we're going to go into a lot of code. So hang on. So this is where we are in the course. Um, data cleanup is coming. Uh, we will get to a little bit of present of visualizations. So I want to cover the skills that we're going to have in the project presentations, so that when we do the projects, we have some skills to build on. So we will do a little bit of visualizations uh, in the next few lectures. All right. So I should make this bigger. All right. Uh, the goals for this evening is to talk about um, data in aspects that you may not have considered previously. Uh, so we're going to try and touch on a lot of different aspects of that. It's not just technical, right? There's also the social skills, the ethical requirements, the laws that you may or may not break, right? These things that matter when you're trying to get a job done. And you should think about ahead of time if you sort of like do the act and then come back and be like, oh, I didn't know there was a law. Like, well, maybe that's an issue, right? So, so thinking ahead before you take action is important. All right. So I focus entirely in this class on open source and free uh, software. And the reason I do that, this is just sort of my ethics of I want my data science to be reproducible by anyone, but also accessible, right? So like if you're coming from an uh, economic background where you can't afford the software I'm running, you could reproduce it if you had the money, but you can't because it's not financially accessible to you. So that's a good consideration that I try and take into account. Something on, on the why am I talking all about this free old software that you know sounds not very exciting because it's not in the news, right? Like I use the old stuff because it works and it's pretty easy to use usually, um, and it's free. So that's the tools that we'll use today. That's not to say that that's the only tools you should ever use, but it's why I talk about the tools I use. And I haven't had this problem so much in this class so far this semester, but I want to get ahead of the issue in case it does happen. Um, if I'm talking up here all the time and you never talk or interact, that's a failure on my part and yours. Right? So typically, when I see a response and then I get nothing, there's a couple of potential explanations for that. And this is a, a, a variation on a uh, sort of concept that was brought up back in the, um, I don't know, a couple of decades ago on the internet of like, when you make a statement and then no one responds, why is that? The person who made this has a Wikipedia entry and he was my coworker. So <laughs> this is a little personal. Brian Warnock is an awesome guy. Um, so this is like his observation on why is it that no one replies? So I do look for engagement with you guys. 
All right, so along those lines, we'll talk a little bit about something that maybe you don't have significant experience in, but you probably have an opinion on. So we'll try and shape that. Quite often in, in my sort of observing the practices of data science, people are super excited about the data and the algorithms and stuff. But as far as like actually doing science, most data scientists are not scientists. Right? They're coming in as something with a little bit of programming, a little bit of math background. But as far as like experience with exper uh, experimental physics or something like that, it's pretty rare. So um, don't feel bad if you're not coming in as a scientist. But you should think a little bit about how are we going to actually do science? And what does it mean to do science? Right? Is anyone here a practicing scientist? OK, good. So <laughs> me neither. <laughs> but the point is, um, the reason science is important to me is because it's how we advance knowledge, right? If you do a thing and then like get a product and like it works and then you never tell anyone else, no one can build on that, right? So, so the relevance here is science enables us to build on each other's knowledge, right? I discover a thing, I tell other people about it in a way that they can reproduce that and then they can build on top of it. That's how we make progress. If we're just making products and no one can build on each other, that sort of inhibits progress. Okay, so just that, that in and of itself is science. Cool. No, it's that's it's not. That's, that's the benefit of science. Says, to... Yep, that's that's the motive for using the scientific approach. We'll say. All right. All right. So basically, this is what I was just talking about. Like, there's a systematic way of building knowledge. Science is how we do that with quantitative data. All right. So the question for you is. Um, <laughs> Find someone who you have not talked to and ask them, what is your perception of the scientific process, right? So this is getting to April's question is like, what is the details right, that you sort of like drop some words on? So find someone you have not talked to who is not. <laughs> if you're sitting in the same seat every week, you'll have to get up. But um, so absolutely. Eventually, I'll be assigning you people. Yeah. So, so talk for a few minutes about what is science. Take one more minute and we'll come back. scientific method but what I have found in my practice that is useful is to sort of like follow this loop and it's not necessarily sequential like you don't necessarily say I'm spending a week here and then next week once I finish this I will move to this one and then after spending a month there I'll do this right so it's not some linear progression that just keeps re re repeating it's actually sort of like I'm doing this but then like you know I was also thinking about this part, and that led me over to here, and then like I came back down here. So it's, it's a little sort of jumpy, but this is sort of like the, the generic flow of which maybe you want to make sure that you're at least checking these steps. So uh, the relatively, the, all this maps into the data science pretty well in the sense of like you gather your CSV, right, or JSON or whatever it is, it shows up in your first step, and then you try and like figure out what is in this data set. So that's sort of like project one, right? Like what's in the data? How do you characterize it? How do you understand the relationships and the variables? 
And eventually what that hopefully leads you to is some ability to tell you a story to your audience or your consumers about that data, right? Your story is basically a model in written form or verbal explanation about what is going on, right? And then the part, this is where like often people get blinded by like the machine learning attractiveness of we can make predictions, right? Well, your predictions are based on this part of knowing what's in your data, right? Like an extrapolating out from there. Um, and then, I'll, so this is where the glory is, right? Making predictions. These other parts, not so uh, you know, attractive to most people, but this is where a lot of your time is spent. And then this is the part that's usually, at the part of like, I made a prediction, and did it work out in practice, right? Not just the, uh, the machine learning model seems to be accurate, but when you want to deploy it to your customer, did they actually make more money, right? That's from a business perspective, you need to validate your assumptions. So the modeling thing is the same, like describing your data is the modeling. Yeah. So I would say you can describe, so there's two different ways to think about it. One is like a very low level of like, what are the statistics of the data? That's, um, I would say more about like discovering those relationships. But your story is like, what is the point of this data, right? So if we remember back to last week, we were talking about the bowling. We can sort of like see there was a trend there. And like, what is the story of why that trend was increasing, right? Was it just because the population in the United States was growing? Or was it because bowling is actually more popular over time? Okay. All right, so uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of sort of like, fancy, rigorous science work that needs to be done in order to advance knowledge. That's not typically where we spend our data scientists. We use data science money, typically, for the commercial uh, world, or if you're in the government, for other purposes. So um, the reason that there is not much validation and making strong claims is because we have different objectives. Right? If you're just here to make money, you could actually produce some model from your data that's wrong. But if it's making more money, do I care? Like, right? <laughs> that is a reasonable attitude that is perhaps unfortunate in like the very like abstract sense. But you no, know, it, it doesn't matter if your model's wrong as long as it's making money, right? How the user is going to know that our model is correct? Well, then, right. That. So there's a difference between correctness and utility. So it's useful if it makes money. It doesn't have to be correct, right? That goes back into the so. Is it correct? You can validate or invalidate assumptions about that model and the predictions, but that may not be relevant. Now, that doesn't apply to all of data science, right? Or not all of data science is aimed at making money. There are some places where it actually does matter that you are really correct, because it would be awfully unfortunate if you were programming the AI for uh, a self-driving car, and that self-driving car were in an accident where the driver was killed, right? Yes, you lost some money on that, but that wasn't the point, right? From an ethical data scientist perspective, it really matters that what isn't just your best effort, but it's like verifiably correct. So again, it depends on what is your application that you're trying to demonstrate with your model. There, again, back to trade-offs. It doesn't always have to be correct, but sometimes it should be. Okay, so. This is another sort of like forgotten aspect of data science. And again, if I give my customer a model that they are happy to run and it works, then I don't have to worry about it because it's in their hands. Right? So I've passed off the responsibility of that maintenance and everything else. Now, if someone else comes to me, um, maybe I want to reuse that code again, right? So often the most common reuse of code is by the person who wrote the code because they know what it is. And so this idea of reproducibility um, is important, but it usually just shows up as I want to reuse the code. And those aren't quite the same thing. Um, so reproducibility is a little bit more grand than just saying, oh, I can run this code on a different problem. Reproducibility is I got a result. Is that robust against changes in the assumptions for the input? Right? So if I say um, I give you a set of pictures and you train your model based on that, and then I give you a slightly different set of pictures, would I expect to get the same result? Right. Um, so it depends on how robust your model is. There's a difference between replication, where I give you the exact same uh, data set, and I give the other person the same data set, they should get the same result. But I give them the same conceptual idea, and the same conceptual idea that's reproducible. Right. 
Okay, so reproducibility, <laughs> it almost never happens unless, unless you're making a very significant intentional effort to make sure that anyone else could run this code against any other data set. That would take a lot of investment, right? So it usually doesn't happen. Um, and so this is a bad thing because when you go to use someone else's code and you say, I'm not applying it to the same data set, but it didn't work. Why is that? Right? It's because the assumptions that they wrote into their software weren't holding for the your situation, whether it's your, your computational environment or the data set you put in or the thing you're trying to do with it. So uh, a lot of the ways that we make shortcuts and efficiency in code is by basing assumptions about the thing that we're doing. Those assumptions usually don't hold or aren't made explicit uh, for the purposes of letting someone else use your code. Does anyone have any examples of they've made some assumptions and then someone else tried to do the same thing? I, I, I typically do this myself, so like I'm writing some code and I want to be quick and efficient, and so I'll take a shortcut. Like, I think this variable is going to return this, this variable type. And then, like, I go off and, you know, I, I come back to this code a month later, and it does not work at all because the assumption that I made about the type of the variable has changed from the input data, and then or it's being used in a way I didn't expect, um, and that's often how I break my own code. So I guess the back of the type checking argument, right? So, like, if you're making a set of assumptions, you should validate it. All right, so I'm going to dive a little bit into the homework review. We had three um, three problems to deal with. Let's see if I can find them. Yeah. Okay. So the one of the first problems, no, what I graded as the first problem, um, was this problem of given a string, I want to return two numeric variables, uh, the number of characters and the number of words. So one thing that tripped people up uh, is the idea of a string as a list. Um, so this is due to in part to the words that I'm using. When I say a string is a list of characters, it's not precisely accurate in the sense of this is also a list of characters, but it's not the same as this thing, which is different, it's a string. So the difference between these two is when I make a change to this one, like if I remove the, the I and the S, then it's actually a different string. So it's, that's a property called immutability. So it, it, it's unchangeable. When I make something that looks like a change, it's actually making a totally different thing. Or if I were to remove a character from this list, it'd still be the same list, but with one less element. So, um, yeah, there was a, there was a, I think if, of the three assignments, this one had the most variability. Um, so almost everyone had slightly different variations on how to do the operation. So you can find a different one. I don't, know if I, I don't think I have any comments. I'm just showing you what different people did. Uh, right. So th these first two, by the way, um, I, I typically left a comment on the assignment to say, put the assignment description at the top of your notebook so that we can both agree what the task is. So somehow that gets lost in the translation between what's in Blackboard and what's in your notebook. Um, so this, the comment that I want to make about this is that uh, they left their old code in a cell that is raw, right? So if you look at the, the type of this cell up here, it's raw. So that's allowing me to see, like, they did some work, but they wanted to show me that they did work, but it's not intended for grading. So it doesn't get executed in Python, but it just lets me know what they were sort of attacking. And then they used the markdown cell. And they had, uh, you know, a more concise variation on what they're trying with a bunch of comments. So I want to just applaud this person and say this was a good approach. And then they didn't quite get um, what I was aiming for with the output. So they counted the number of characters in each of these. Uh, yeah. So here's the A is B is the input string, and they counted the number of characters in each word. And they found the number of words. So it wasn't quite what I was aiming for, but um, this is uh, a reasonably good approach for the requirement. Okay. So this one here, they, they included the requirement task, and then they had another function. So 
again, just showing the variant variations on the approaches. So this is what I was intending to, to get out was a two different variables as a return, and then they could um, get those back from an input string. Okay. So we have any commentary on that? Yeah, April. I have a question. So can, is there any way for us to have access to these extensions for our future knowledge? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have thought about how to do that. Um, so I think the way that I'll, so I don't quite, I don't quite feel comfortable like releasing other people's code like as a notebook. If we want to come to a consensus as a class that's acceptable, these are anonymous, right? They don't have any names associated with them. Um, but they are in the uh, screen recordings that are available online. So does that make sense? I mean, okay, I'd like to know what the right answer is. Well, that, and that's my <laughs> other hesitancy. So the reason I kind of feel hesitant about releasing sort of like notebooks with the source in them, with the code in them, is because I wouldn't want to be seen as endorsing this is the method, right? Like, so, so, so I, I'm a little hesitant. I try and show multiple examples of what would be considered a good or bad solution. I don't want to come down and say, like, this is how it should be attacked, right? That, that's not my goal. I don't need to see efficient code or really clever code. Those aren't my goals. But there's a variety of ways to attack every homework problem. So I don't know. If, if that if it doesn't add, satisfy your question, probably, but the code is available in a screen capture. OK, so I think this is another one. This was the CSV. Right, so this one. Um, I'd say most people got all the assignment on this one. It was pretty straightforward just to load in some data and then uh, look at the head and tail. So the, the most common issue here is that, OK, do we have comments? OK, so the most common issue that I saw here was the use of print um, around that. And yeah, I can't I can't rerun this, actually. It, it, but it, it, Display the uh, so if I if I type data dot head eight it'll show the first eight rows, and when I use the print to wrap that up, then it uh, doesn't include the formatting. So that's like a minor sort of issue. But the other danger of print is that if I have a really large CSV and I try and print the entire data frame, it'll likely crash my notebook if the CSV is large enough. So the value of not using print is you get the formatting, right? You get this. But then you also, um, Pandas tries to protect your computer from crashing by uh, uh, slicing out the middle. So like if you have, I, I've, I've worked with data, with data frames that have like 5,000 columns and you know, a million rows, and you wouldn't want to write print for that. So I don't, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to think about whether or not I'm handing you those this semester. I don't think so. All right, so there, and then there was lots of different ways that I saw people using transpose, but um, again, lots of variations on, on that method. So I think like uh, data uh, in other notebooks, data.head uh, for dot t I think also works. And then they can do a numpy transpose as well. So again, lots of variations on that. Um, and the I think I showed how to do that in a previous notebook. OK, the last set of homeworks. Let's pull up a quick one here. OK, so this was like the standard that a lot of people took, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, and then I saw a couple of people who wrote the function, wrote the code to do the operation, but it wasn't in a function, so they didn't get full points for that. Um, yeah, you know, I think this was just like to show you that <laughs> there there were some submissions that I was just like, I don't know what the heck that's doing, but it works, so that's cool. <laughs> I like, I <laughs> just imagine there's 25 different people with a variety of coding backgrounds all submitting the same solution. They're almost never the same solution, and they see I see techniques. I'm just like, uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> OK, so we'll jump back to the presentation. All right, does anyone have any comments, either as just an audience member or a contributor? All right. Yeah. Uh, then the CSV 
thing which you had shown. Yeah. Is there a way to select columns before typically naming them? Mm, I, I think so I think you can go by index for a column. Answer is yes. The dynamics of how to do that will take offline. Okay. okay. All right. So this is that deep dive that I was warning you about. We're going to talk about how data actually shows up on your computer. Right. I will keep waiting. I'm just trying to get some attention. So the normal way that you browse the internet, I'm going to make the claim, is by using a web browser. If you don't see me after class, and we'll talk. Um, got some problems. So the, the web is how normal people access content on the internet. And there's nothing wrong with that, unless you're a data scientist. The problem is, when I make a search, I get a lot of results back. right? And so like if I have 174,000 results, there's no way a human did that. right? So we use computers to get data. And the relevance here as a data scientist is, you typically don't want to get just a web page. You want to get all the web pages. Right? So we know that Google can do that. Can we do that? The answer is yes. Right, so think of like I want to get all of the teapots listed on eBay. How would I do that? Well, I could click there for like hours, right? Or I could just scrape the entire content of that site. So that's what we'll talk about. Right, so I'm going to focus a lot um, in this section on how to get data off the internet. That's not the only way data shows up. I'll also be spending time in this class on how to get um, content from Word documents and PDFs and APIs. If you haven't heard of those, don't feel bad. Um, and that, so like, and the point here is there's a bunch of different ways of getting data. And you should be comfortable with all of that. Because right? data is just going to show up in a variety of ways. And if it shows up in some way you've been before, it's a new learning opportunity for you. Okay, so the joke here is, of course I can internet. That was a, that was a joke. All right. So, so this is again how people get um, data, and again, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you don't need very much because it's limited by how much you can type in. And so, um, we want to remove that limit. And in order to educate you, I'll need to introduce a few new words. So you're existing on a client. That's like your endpoint for your computer, cell phone. That's who is getting the data. And then the thing providing the data is typically called a server. And whether that's in the cloud or some you know, person's business, it doesn't really matter. This is a computer, and that's a computer. And they interact um, by sending requests to the person who has the data, or the server that has the data. And they send back responses. So it shouldn't be too scary, but the point is, in the domain of sending data back and forth between computers, there's a lot of special words. And that shouldn't intimidate you, but you should just be aware of them so you know how to speak that language. All right, so now we're going a little bit deeper. So we've got this idea that two computers send data back and forth. Well, they don't email each other. They actually send these things called packets. And packets um, have data about how should I get from one place to another, and where am I coming from, and what's the content of the information that I'm sending? Right? That's the idea of a packet. Um, so the cool thing is all the data that goes on across the internet goes in these packets. And that means if we have the ability to capture packets off the internet, we can capture any data source. That's really cool. And get this, someone else was so excited about this idea that they wrote software for you to use to do packet captures. So this is a, a snapshot of Wireshark. This is an application that allows you to see the packets being trans between your computer and any other computer that your computer is talking to. Cool, right? So if, who here is excited about cybersecurity? Do I have any cybersecurity people? No. OK, <laughs> well, <laughs> that was not good. But the point here is um, there are a lot of packets flowing between computers. 
And cybersecurity is a very hot field. Um, if you know stuff about networks and packets, you'll get hired immediately. So this is a big data source, right? How many packets traverse your computer and another? Millions every hour, right? And so that means if we're going to analyze the network traffic, we need really big computers to solve really hard problems about like all these computers talking to each other and they're sending data back and forth, and which one's malicious, which one represents a danger to us, which one's trying to attack us, all that sort of information. It's a big data problem with this packet analysis. All right, so that was sort of like the, the little deep dive. Um, a little bit more about how we actually send data back and forth between your computer and another from sort of like the protocol perspective. You type in uh, a little address bar like google.com. And that address is basically looking for a location of another computer that's serving the information. And so all of this is mediated by your web browser. Someone else wrote a program to do that, right, to get the information back and render it for you. So that's useful because if you can't actually get a lot of useful data out of the network traffic, you can interact with another computer as though you were a browser right, without using a browser. So it helps a little bit to know how your web browser gets that internet content if that turns out to be the best way to get the information. Okay. This is a little out of, yeah. So all of these are, these two concepts are related in the sense that your web browser talks to other computers over packets, and you can actually see, you can validate my claim to you. Uh, like if I type in this address, it shows up in the body of a packet being sent to another computer. So <laughs> we will not go deep uh, in showing you how to do that in this class, but just to know all the things I'm talking about, um, it is a data source that you could analyze. So. I think I had a couple of people in previous semesters analyze packet capture data because um, these big data sets, they get posted on the internet. Right? Typically, some university will have a network capture of all the packets for like four days for their campus. Right? And the challenge is, can you find the bad malicious actors on that network in those four days? That's an example problem. So. We've gone a little bit deep. Now we're going to come back out and say, like, what are the tools that you'll use? Right? I'm going to talk about two uh, command line tools, curl and wget, and then two Python packages. Curl and wget are something like 20 or 30 years old. They're super old. Right? They were before computers had web browsers. So you're like, wow, oh, that's super strange. Like, why do we use that? And the answer is, if you want to go back to that question of, like, I have 100, 174,000 pages on the UMBC domain. How would I get those? Right? You'd use one of these packages to scrape data. All right, so scraping is a whole can of worms. <laughs> and the problem is, um, you don't own that content, and you want it. And uh, there are laws in place that protect the people who provide the content from the people who are trying to steal it from them. Right? So there's this like strange boundary of, well, doesn't the customer need to go to a website? Yes. Okay. But what if I want to go to eBay and take all of their listings to put on my website? Well, that's not quite the same role as a customer, is it? Right? So this weird boundary between at what point do I transition from just a normal user clicking on a web page to downloading all of the website's content to replicate on my server? Right? That's, that's, that's where it gets a little sketchy. Um, so unfortunately, the legal advice depends on where you are and where the person you're stealing the content is, right? And sometimes even like how much, uh, like the terms of service come into play. Like you know, you click on the I agree statements of I agree to use this website in a responsible manner. Like those may matter. So there's a lot of legal stuff, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to try and protect you. That's just something to. So the, the reason this comes up um, in my practice is I, one of my friends is a, a freelance worker. If you've gone on the site Freelancer or WeWork, um, not really. uh, so often he'll get job requests because he's a data scientist of like, hey, can you go get this website from this company, right, which sounds like a totally fine thing. I right? just go get the content, okay? But then like, well, why do you need that? Uh, 
Oh, we're just hosting it uh, on our website. Oh, okay, so why are you doing that? And like, so it gets into this, like, you know, what's the intent? How fast are you getting that content? How frequently do you want to pull it? All these sorts of like weird questions, and then it gets into, well, what's your real purpose, right? Like, you're not just sort of curious, are you? So that's work that he gets. Okay. So has anyone here seen um, the, the way that people protect their websites besides the terms of service? Okay, so good. We will take a look at that. So I'm going to pull up a website that was sort of, this is a rarity, so I've just pulled it up because it is unusual. So I'm not sure why I was at this website. Let's go to the front page and see what they're about. All right. So this is a super exciting website. They list the states. Mm -hmm. OK, so, so this all makes it even stranger. They have a terms of use, right? Of like how you can use website. And it says, you agree not to scrape this content or harvest or mine or anything else, right? So they're very particular. That might be because other people have scraped their website a lot, right? Like if you're 50states.com, it's like a really reasonable place to get a list of the 50 states from, right? So they have this terms of service. Now where it gets kind of strange is what's the likelihood of them deploying their lawyer to hunt you down? They don't even know your name, right? I mean, like it's just it, going through the whole legal system of like this person from this IP address my content on this date, and therefore I need like a warrant to search the ISP to figure out who it is so I can chase them down in court. Like that's a lot of work, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there's a lot of obfuscation. So the challenge here is like these are typically unenforceable agreements, and it's really expensive to chase it down into the legal system. Right. So typically these are used to scare people. Like this is this is the, the primary point, in my opinion. Um, but so it's just something to look for if like what are the people who are hosting the content, what do they think is reasonable? Like, these people do not think that automating content removal from their site is reasonable. So then it shouldn't surprise you when they block you uh, for access. I'll get back to so the reason they're trying to protect themselves is because it takes money for them to host this content. If they have to buy a server, they have to do the research for the content, they have to um, spend the bandwidth, right? And so all of these things cost money. So the more content that you're stealing from them or grabbing from them, it's going to cost them more money. So that's their sort of financial incentive. Yeah. Yes. So, you, so a website owner can make it increasingly difficult to scrape content from a website. So there's sort of like the, the terms of service. There's what I'll cover next, which is robots.txt, which is sort of like an informal technical agreement that people can follow this rule. But there are certainly other ways that people, like there's some website owners spend a lot of time making sure that it's hard to scrape content from their site. And there's lots of, it's, it's like a war that goes on. You know, first you get the dumb attack, and then you build up a defense against that. And then someone comes in with a slightly smarter attack against your site, and you build up a defense against that. And it's just this unending investment you can make. Okay, so the other sort of, there's a terms of service which is meant for humans. There's another mechanism called robot.txt. It's worth checking um, for uh, a robot.txt before you crawl a website. Typically, it's at the top level domain, so like, cs.n.edu has a robots.txt file. And this is basically a, intended for computers to read this and figure out where on the website it is reasonable to go to. So all of these places are allowed, and these places the computer should not go to. So if you're scraping a website and you're a nice person, you look at this robots.txt and then figure out what's, what's content you can take. No. Mm -hmm. I would say most webs, most major webs do have a robots.txt file, but most smaller sites don't. Because, and the reason it goes back to that sort of like war that goes on, robots.txt is not an enforcement mechanism. It's just sort of like a, a nice agreement that this is what the website intends you to access. There's no, that is not really to enforcement. So, 
it's not widely used, I would say, but it's mostly available on large sites. Okay, so now <laughs> I'm not, so I, the way that I try and teach ethics is to allow you to have conversations about ethical and moral dilemmas. So I'm not trying to tell you what's right or what you should do or where the boundary is. So now I'm asking you to get up. Um, and we will have a few minutes to talk about what those ethical boundaries are in your practical experience. So you will have to get up and talk to other people. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so my, my question, I'm not going to ask you all of what you talked about, but my curiosity is, um, did anyone have any disagreements about what the right thing to do was? Okay, yes? Yeah. Why, why is that? Why is it? Why are they different than other businesses? Because they don't have much uh, like finances, so they're more vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Make it easier. Yeah. But why would you say this is like this assets like this is strengthened? Yeah. Like it's not available for you to scrape it. I think it's honest. So this is like a common debate of like if I make a copy of a thing, it doesn't deprive the original owner of the ownership. Right. This is the great thing about digital bits is you can make copies of ones and zeros, but it also introduces this dilemma of like, well, I'm just replicating all of your content. You know, is that decreasing the value? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's another aspect of like, what is your intent with the data that you're taking, right? Is it just for your own internal use and analysis, or do you want to remix the content into something else? Right? Are you simply copying it for some other nefarious purpose? So, right. I'm going to give you a, um, a practical example of maybe some questionable behavior. So, has anyone here heard of the dating website, OKCupid? Okay, so this is a website on which if you if you're a human, there are other humans on the same website who are potentially looking for some sort of connection. Um, so this dating website is pretty popular, I'd say. And so uh, back like a few ago, a uh, group of uh, researchers, researchers right, took all the available public content from OKCupid, the dating website, and like made it available. Okay. Yeah. That's probably a reasonably true statement. Right, so this, well, this is the question. So OKCupid makes profiles publicly available on their website. So all the researchers did was just bring all that publicly available uh, data together in one place, right? making it much more accessible to do analysis. So that, that's the question, right? If I, if I put my profile online of like, I'm Ben seeking, you know, whatever relationship, is that something that I really want to share? Probably not, right? Like not everybody is comfortable doing that. Um, so there's some sort of question about how invasive does it need to be to be private, right? So like if we're in relation to the age and gender and location and the type of people they're interested in, all these different things, those are something that maybe I don't want revealed, even though it's not like, Really sensitive, but maybe it's something I'm just sort of like sensitive about. So, yeah, <laughs> not everyone will agree with your behavior no matter what you do, but there's something where more people will be likely against it. This would be one of those cases. Okay, so I think we're gonna go on break, come back at 8.06. <laughs>
Okay, I think we're all. No, we got one more. All right, so we're gonna get started again with some programming tools. Uh, these these two tools of wget and curl. I'm not gonna. Uh, have examples of how you'll use them uh, in, in like an assignment or anything, but for my purposes, I definitely think they're worth being aware of. They're very robust tools. Like I mentioned, WGate is 22 years old, and the reason it's still popular is because it's very reliable. So, for instance, uh, I've run WGate commands that take days, right? Because I'm, I'm doing rate limiting. That's the idea of. I want to get all the content from this website, but I want to do it at a rate that looks indistinguishable from a normal person just clicking on a website. And so you can run these commands for a really long time, and if they get interrupted, you can just resume. And it's a handy feature. All right, I'll just get to the, the meat of it, and we'll pull up an example of running wget against this website. All right. So I'm just in a notebook in my terminal. And I happen to be running a uh, variant of Linux or Unix so that I can actually just run this on the command line. So this is just to get you exposed to what it does. So the messages that it's spitting out here is telling you what actions it's taking. So I told it to go to a website called www.fogcam.org. It went there. It found out where that computer is. That's an IP address. If you haven't seen those before, welcome. And then it goes off and it finds the web page at that address called index.html. That's the actual web page. And then it goes and downloads it and tells you it saved it. Um, so now if I look in my directory again, I should be able to see index.html. Mm, here it is. OK, so that may be exactly what I wanted, in which case I'm done. More often, wget is used, like if I want to get all of the web pages from a given website, what wget starts at one web page, follows all the links, looks in all the directories, gets all the content. Back. That's more typically how it's used. So in that case, if I am doing something a little bit grander, something larger, I'll do uh, like what I was saying there before. I'll put in like a rate limit. And the reason that's important is because if you don't have a rate limiter or something that delays the activity, it will just use up all your bandwidth and all of the server's bandwidth. Which is fast, right? I mean, that's a good thing. Fast is good, but not if like you're trying to overwhelm the server. Right? So, like often, putting some sort of delay in the sequence that it's going through or a rate limit is a good practice. Okay, so I, I typically don't mend just like playing around with random websites on with WK and curl, but I'll, I'll point you to some websites later in these slides uh, that that are explicitly set up for you to scrape. So. There are websites intended for that purpose, um, so you can get started there with those tools. Yeah, so I showed you the. Yes, uh, well, so you can run it in Python uh, as a as a Python library, and I think WGIS is probably available for Windows depending on which version you're running in. So the terminal in Windows is not the same as the terminal that I have because I'm running a Mac, but I think WGIS is probably available for Windows. Okay, so you'll notice one of the things here is that wget was intended for those website addresses like HTTP, HTTPS. Um, there's another tool called curl, which is um, way more robust. Like it handles all these different protocols that you've never heard of, which is fine. Um, but it's a little bit more uh, useful if I'm doing strange things. Like wget is just getting content. Curl is like for sending commands and interacting with servers. It's a little more interactive. All right, the behavior is not too different. We'll take a look at that here. So if I run just curl.www.fogcam. Make it a little bit bigger. Oh, uh, oh, that's unfortunate. All right, I have a bug on my computer. So normally that would just grab the same index at HTML and print it to screen, and you'd see the raw HTML. So I apologize for passing it out. I'm a little surprised. All right, we'll come back to why that didn't work. Maybe I'll show you after break, but 
that'll be no more. All right, so it basically just dumps all the web page um, through the screen, and it's uh, useful. The reason that, so like in wget, we're dumping a file onto the disk, and in curl, it's dumping the text of that uh, file to screen. That might be useful if you want to use other tools to parse that in the same workflow, rather than splitting it off into a separate file. But all right, now we'll get into a Python library called request. That's where I get to go off and show you a notebook. This is how I will request. I will ask that you use request typically when getting data. I'll show you why that's useful. Yeah. So I'm going to run this notebook and walk through the steps that I'm taking. So request is a library, and the use is pretty straightforward to get started. Just request.get and the address you're going to. So let's take a look at what that page actually looks like. So we have some idea of where we're going. All right. So this this web page happens to be a CSV file. So it's on the internet. We just want to download it into our notebook and use it. So when we get the the response, we're just going to store that in a variable, and then we can look at the output. Um, it's a little. Oops. We run that. Have to start from the beginning. All right. So the variable that we're getting the response back in, we'll just take a look at the type of that. And that's um, in the request library. So there's some special features in that variable. It's not just some like flat text file. So to access the actual content as the CSV, we'll look at the the text attribute from that variable, and then we'll run the split command and get back the same thing that we saw on the web page. This is basically our CSV parsed out into a such a set of strings in uh, a list. All right, so so we went back. If you look at the web page that we were at, that was a CSV. It was reasonably long, right? And so when we load that into our pandas, uh, when we load in the Jupyter, sorry, then it's taking up a really large amount of the page. And so that's sort of like annoying to scroll through. So this is not a Jupyter tip. If you get into that problem and you want to make this output cell a little bit smaller, you can click over on this blue sidebar on the left-hand side. And when I click on that, it's going to collapse the output into these triple dots. So that's sort of handy if you have like this giant output and you want to see what it is, but then like I want to hide it. So it's still there, just a way to hide it. OK, so now if you're not familiar with this page, um, welcome to the internet. And I'll pull that up. This is not a CSV, right? Um, and so when we pull this content using a request, we'll get something that's not quite as convenient to, to work with. So again, I'm going to run this cell. I get back the fact that we did get, actually get a response. But then if I look at the text in that file, it's not very, not very readable. Right? This is the actual source of the page. That's the, the, the thing that your computer receives. Um, and yet you are then rendering in the browser. Okay, so this is the difference between what the computer receives and what you see. Okay, that, we're good on that. All right, so this is what the computer sees. It's also huge, right? Like, that is a lot of stuff to scroll through. Again, I don't want to scroll through that. I, I mean, I appreciate that it's there. I, I'm really grateful that the request library worked. I'm just going to collapse it. All right, so. Let's go off and, and see if we can do slightly better. All right, like this is I've already gotten a project proposal from a person who wants to basically analyze a list that's on a web page. That's cool, right? That's totally reasonable. And what I've sort of imposed as a constraint is that I want you to download this web page using the request library. So let's see how to do that. All right. So we have a list, we know this as a structure that we want. How will we get that? So again, if we go into the request and I look at the result from this web page, this is the source code for that web page. It's nowhere near the list that I want. Right? I can sort of see, if I look in this, this list is huge, by the way. So I look for Abbey Park Street in the web page. That appears um, like right at the top. But down here, it's way embedded in, in this like long string of text. So it's going to be a real mess to, to parse. 
Right, so I'm, I'm setting up a problem. We'll get to the solution in a little bit. Right, so this is basically to show you that request is for getting web page content. But that's merely the first step. I'll go back to my presentation. So that was, I've, I've, set, I've now set you up with one Python library that's great data. Another one is called Scrappy. So this is a website that, or sorry, a package that I will not demonstrate. It's a little bit more complicated than I think we need in this class. It's meant to replicate the capabilities of something like that Google uses. Google uses a, a, a crawler that goes across the entire internet and looks at all the content, and then brings it back to the Google headquarters, and Google puts in a giant database called Bigtable, and they analyze it, and they get your search results. We don't need something quite that powerful, right? We're just grabbing web pages. So I'm merely gonna show that this exists, and that if you do wanna test out your ability to go and get content, there are a couple of sites that you can sort of play with um, without getting in trouble or causing harm. So this is a, a, a random web page, not really random, but it's, it's got content on it that you actually don't care about. So this is like a, a playground for you to go and try these tools out if you want. So they're, in, they're intentionally designed for you to be able to scrape them. That doesn't mean they're easy to scrape, but it means that the, the target is available. This other one, books to scrape, right? Now, this might be like, oh, look, a product list that I'd want to scrape. Right? I mean, like, this is a very generic task. I don't actually care about these books, right? But a typical data science task would be like, okay, can you give me uh, a list of all the books, the uh, titles and pictures and prices and steps? Right? It's a very reasonable question to ask from a human perspective, but for a scraping task, it's reasonably complicated. And to load this all into like an SQL database, it takes a lot of work. So, but it, these websites exist for the purpose of you scraping them. Okay. All right. So, as I was mentioning, um, there's this web uh, browser that contains a web page and is based on the source of the of the page. So, I want you to go to the UMBC website and see that for yourself. If you've never seen it before, pull it up. So I will do that myself in a couple of different browsers, but I want to get you started. You can actually see this content. And the reason it's useful for you to do this is because when you're scraping content from a website and you find this bug, why did my scraper break? What is it choking on? What's going wrong? Right? Your first entry point will be to open up your web browser and view the source of that website. So you're all running to do is running Windows, Mac, I think I'm running Linux, but you've got a bunch of different web browsers. So if you have questions about how to get to that content, have a question. Your neighbor is like something. So if you've never seen it before, the source code you're looking at is typically HTML and uh, JavaScript and cascading file sheets, CSS. That's the almost all the web is developed off of that. So those three sort of you know, languages might be the syntax. Looks like most people have it up, so I'll just pull up quickly. So I went and I'm in using Firefox. So I'm going to click on View. Uh, let's see. Edit Tools. There we go. Tools. The Web Developer. Uh, which one? Page Source. All right. So this is what your computer requests from the server. You're the client. You're getting the data from the server. It gets this content back in little chunks called packets. All right. So what your computer had to do is get all the information from the server in these packets, reassemble it into this text document, and then your text document goes to the web browser, and the web browser translates this into this. It's a really, I mean, like, on, I, I really appreciate the complexity of this workflow, right? You had to invent physical computers. You had to invent networks. You had to invent packet transfer. You had to have routers in place. 
All of this gear runs 24-7 worldwide for your benefit to get to this web page. That's amazing. And you're using free software like Firefox to get to this content right, that someone else is hosting for you. We live in an, amer an, an, an amazing age, right? I mean, this is fantastic. I'm just, this is fun. Right. So that's what your computer is getting. The relevance to you is if you're a data scientist, you have to put this into a data structure where maybe you want to pull out Scott Casper, Dean of C-A-H-S-S. I have no idea who that is, but maybe if I'm scraping all the content from the UMBC website, I want to figure out who all the people are at UMBC. So that's something I have to get from the website. Okay, so this is sort of like a, a standard task. Named entity recognition is a specific field there. OK, so I left you with a little bit of a teaser. We used request to get that source code from the web page. I'm going to show you another library that allows you to actually parse the HTML code. So I'll pull up what that looks like. All right. So this is a library again called Beautiful Soup. Um, I'm going to, I've sort of isolated the task of parsing HTML from the task of getting HTML. So this notebook is just about taking some HTML and analyzing it. Right. So I've, I've set up a string here that is this huge block of content. It's just HTML code. If you haven't played with HTML before, I totally recommend learning it. It's very easy to learn. It's hypertext markup language. It's worth learning. <laughs> That's a testimonial. I can do it. Yeah. Okay, do we have questions? Sorry, are there questions? Okay. All right, so in the HTML, I'm going to take this text document that I have, I'm going to put it in a variable called soup. This is a like standard variable name for this library. Um, and then I'm going to take this soup and I look at the title. If that's an attribute that's available. Because if we look at this HTML code, it has a title tag. Right? The, the begin tag, end tag is title. So the content there is available as something that's been parsed by beautiful soup. And then we can get even to the string of the tag. So that's cool. That's typically not what we're doing. What we're typically doing is we take the HTML page and we want to find all the links. And so here we're looking for tags that start with A and have an href property because those are the way that we set, we identify links in a web page. The reason that those are useful is because typically you go to one web page, you want to find all the links to all other web pages and then follow those. So you get this like really branching uh, complexity of web pages that link to web pages that link to web pages and you have to go to all those links. Very standard task. All right. So that was just beautiful soup. So now we're going to go crazy, right? Obviously, the goal is to get the HTML and then read the HTML. All right, so the way we'll do that, I'm going to run this out. So we're going to install uh, an HTML parser, and then we're going to grab a web page. Let's take a look at that web page first before we go to it, just so we know what we're aiming for. <coughs> Okay, I don't. I have this fixation on states. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just lazy, right? But states are typically presented in a table format, rather than make them easy to sort of show as an example. This website has the state name and the abbreviation. So obviously, I need a pandas data frame that has those things. I'll just grab it from the internet. Sounds like a very reasonable task. Yes, it's not. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you will need to take. But this isn't this isn't the task you'll need, but you'll invariably run into the problem where I want to grab a table from the internet from a web page. That is a generic task. All right. So we're going to use the request library to pull the web page from the server to our computer, and then once we've got that, we can use Beautiful Soup to look at the code. Right. So remember when we were looking at that Wikipedia code, it was also jammed together in one big, huge, long string. There's helpfully a command called prettify. Yeah, so so if I just printed soup, it would just have like this really long string of like incomprehensible HTML code. But if I use the prettify command, I can actually sort of print it as a formatted set of data. So it makes it easier for the human to read. Okay, this is right. Again, the web page is super long, 
And I don't want to scroll all the way through, so I'm just going to collapse that output into the triple dots so I can go to the next cell. Okay. Now I happen to know, I, I know a little HTML, and I know that the tag that decorates a table is called table. So that makes it pretty easy to find, right? So I just look for HTML elements that have the word table in them, and then I just find them. Okay, so what Beautiful Soup returns is a list of the tables. So there's often more than one table in the HTML page. In this case, there's two. So I'm just going to print out the contents of the first element, which is the zeroth index. And that doesn't look quite like the table I want. So probably irrelevant. Fine. OK, so let's look at the other table in my list. This looks way more relevant, right? It's got the, the Alabama, Alaska, AK, good stuff. And I'm just going to collapse it because that's that is the table I want. Mm. Up. Uh, let's see, we're looking. Ah, this. that was just an. So <laughs> remember back to that um, the presentation I gave where I had to like find all the arguments that made it work. This is one of those. So you'll notice up above here, I had to load this library called HTML5lib. That's another, so beautiful soup comes with an HTML parser. But the parser that beautiful soup uses isn't sufficiently advanced to parse this web page. Ah, parsing. Okay, so, so if I have an HTML document, like let's say I look on, uh, oh, where is it? Developer. Users. Right. That was a good question, by the way. So he's asking, what is a parser? It is the parser is the thing that takes this document and looks for a read element. So first, let's make this bigger. I have a computer program that basically looks through here and finds this HTML tag. Right. Okay. I, the parser, know what to do with that. That means that is the start of the document. Now I can start to form a data structure. OK, this is now the head. I know what to do with that. I place that in another data structure. So it's sort of like taking the information as presented and transforming it into something other things can use. Not that. Does that clarify uh, sufficient? Yes. Yes. Into a data structure that's more useful. Right? This is basically a set of characters and carriage returns. right? And like it's something that doesn't look like a web page. So the parser is the thing that reads this specially formatted code into the web page. Right. Okay. So the question here is the HTML parser that came with Beautiful Soup wasn't sufficiently advanced to parse the HTML in that web page, so I had to use a different HTML parser. Okay. So now we've got some tables, and this is the table we want. So it looks like we're pretty close. Sorry? Yep. Print. Yeah. So, so the when I find the tag table, that tag may show up more than once in an HTML document. So the variable returned is a type of list. So I have to or a result set in this case, but it's basically a list. Right. Okay. So that that was a, a list of tables. So then I get back the table. Um. So I think okay. So Every element in HTML uh, for the table has a table row and table data. So those are two tags in HTML that specify where I am in the table. And so that means if I find the TR, the table row tags, those are the things that look like rows. And it happens to be correct, right? So I find something that says state and abbreviation. Those would be the column headers for my table. So looking good. So now I can go through and uh, extract the content from that table by the rows. Uh, yeah, so it's a big list, and that's it. So that's the part where I'm getting to is you can you all convert that into a pandas data frame, and you look pretty happy. So I think that's the end. Oh, yeah. So that was sorry. That was the example with the request and beautiful soup. So that's good, right? That's a lot of work, but we got what we wanted. Whoop. Right. So now I'm lazy. I like pandas. Right. Let's try to throw pandas at the same web page. Right. 
So I get back some, I read HTML and I sort it into a variable, and then I say, what's the type of that variable? It's also a list. Okay. How long is the list? Two. Hmm, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? Right. So let's look at that first table. Okay, it's not the table we wanted, obviously. Uh, how about the other one? Oh, well, that was the one we wanted. Oh, wow, that was amazing, right? I mean, look at the work we saved, right? So, so right, Pandas is meant to work with tables. And Pandas is smart enough that when you pass an HTML that contains one or more tables, it just takes those out. So this is probably what you're looking for. So Pandas took all the every data was other than tables. And Pandas just took the two tables which were there on that HTML. And all the tables come on the same screen. Uh, so that was a, remember, this was a, they returned back a list of the tables. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's way faster if you can do that. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, so that, so not all tables are well constructed. Then they may have different tags, and so pandas may not work. And then you become sad, and you say, oh, I have to use beautiful soup and request. <laughs> so yeah. So it, that, that, I guess my recommendation off that is start with pandas. If pandas finds the HTML table, use it. Like, you know, Unless there's a problem, then you need to work harder, and that's where all this work comes in, right? Parsing the HTML. Huh? Oh, yeah. These are posted on Blackboard. Yeah. OK. I think I got uh, one more. Yeah, OK. So this is sort of a fun one. Um, so again, this is using the same library request in Beautiful Soup on a slightly different web page. So let's go there and just check out this web page. It's super fun. Right. So this is a this is a web page, right? It looks reasonably you know, straightforward. What could be what could go wrong, right? Um, <laughs> And it has what looks like a table on it, right? Good stuff. All right, so let's start seeing it. All right, so I run the request. I, I use beautiful soup. And I get back this HTML code. So if you're really uh, excited to see, it is not the table you wanted. It says, access to this resource on this <laughs> server is denied. <laughs> <laughs> That's super weird. <laughs> That's not the table, is it? Huh. All right. Well, all right. I think I have a way around this. Let's see if I have the next notebook here. Huh? Then you have a different problem. This one is text. So that was a good question. It's not uh, an image, and I can verify that it is in fact text. And I can even, if you really want, let's. Uh, I think I can actually see the source on this web page. Have you page? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. The actual table is present in HTML, right? So this goes back to that war of, you know, how are you defending your website against getting content? Well, apparently I can get the web page in a web browser, but then when I request it using the request library in Python, the web page says nope. So this is kind of exciting. I mean, I was trying to find this. Exactly. Good quote. That is the goal, right? To get past their their defenses. <laughs> All right. All right. So I think, yeah, so this is where we go off the rails a little bit into uh, computer land. Um, so you can restart this. Uh, oh yeah, so this is a slightly different web page, but um, basically the, the idea is that they were blocking our web page. Let's see if that's, I, I think that may be true. I don't know if they have a mm, robots.txt. Let's just see what they have robots.txt. Yeah, so there we go, right? They're disallowing all of these, and I was respecting that. OK, so just because the disallow statement is there, we can violate that. I mean, we have computers. So this is an example where it's, it is a different website. But uh, I, yeah. so I think we can go through and uh, violate the, the, the disallow statement, um, I think. So I'm being lost in my own, got ahead of myself. All right. So we can actually get the content even though it's a block in place. Uh, 
and my flap sail. Yeah. So we'll go back to the slides at this point. But you will get blocked, um, and you can violate the robots.txt. All right, so we showed the, the two different command line tools, which are also available in Python, and then also two Python libraries, request and scrappy. Um, and then we used beautiful soup on top of that and showed how pandas is actually a little bit faster if it's applicable. Okay, so for my purposes, you're either going to use pandas or request in beautiful soup. All right. So the APIs, uh, this is uh, another section that you typically won't use in this class. Most data that we use is not exposed as an API, but it's worth um, being aware of so that when you run, in it, run into it in the wild, you'll sort of <laughs> have some exposure to it. Doing fine there. All right, so there is a website that UMBC hosts. Can you find it? Yeah. Okay, so this, I don't know who, who posts the swoogle.umbc.edu, but it's a website somebody else owns. Um, and the purpose of this website is called the Semantic Textual Similarity. So what it does is it ranks um, how, so it, you know, it gives you two words, and then how close are they? It gives you a rank. And the purpose of this website is not to be used by humans, but to be used by computers. All right, so let's look at their example. They want to compare how close are car and and they give you back a numerical value, 0.386, blah, 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 whatever, okay? So this is like, like APIs are sort of weird. They're on a computer, humans can read them, but they're intended for other computers to use. And this, this is like, uh, it sounds weird at first, but then it becomes super powerful. So you can have an application running on your computer that reaches out to another computer for a service and then it gets the result back to your computer without you having to be present and, and sort of manually touching this interaction. Right? Typically, the way you've interacted with other computers is by using a web browser and clicking on things. This is now your computer can use another computer. The power there is um, if this, so a couple examples. If the person who ran this website doesn't want you to know how their algorithm works, they can expose to you a result for some data that you have without you knowing how their code works. Right. So that's one use case. If you want to sort of like protect your intellectual property, you can put an API, and then people can only make requests. Right? You've never necessarily seen their data, or the, the, the content owner doesn't know what you're going to send them, but they can analyze it and send you a result. Back. That's one use case. The other use case is maybe you have a laptop and these people have a really big cloud, right? Or some like, you know, racks of servers that it takes to do the computation. You don't want to have to be on that really big computer to do the work. Maybe you just have a task that's computationally expensive that you want to send to that computer and then send the results back. Right, so this, this allows you and your small computer to leverage someone else's resources that you don't have to be responsible for, is available 24-7, and could be arbitrarily powerful. That's, that's really neat, right? That's um, one of the advantages of well, what we'll say is like the cloud, right? Amazon, Azure, um, these services are basically doing that. They offer some interface that you can interact with and get results back without actually having to maintain all the equipment. That's a good thing. All right, so I just showed you sort of like the a very strange web page, and it has some human intended text, but the primary use case for this website is to do analysis, and so. If you, hopefully you can see this, but in the URL, I was sending a couple of variables. So I'm sending car and bike in a specially encoded way that the computer then knows how to handle and respond. So can someone give me a couple of words that maybe would be useful to analyze? Cat and dog, all right, good choice. Cat and dog. All right, those are very close, 0.8, I guess. Again, I don't know how this algorithm works or what the real purpose is, but at least I can use the API. Huh? <laughs> so this, but now you're sort of going down the rabbit hole of how do we break the computer? <laughs> Negative infinity. There you go. All right. Good question. All right. So you can use the request library 
not only to get data back from a server, but to send to the server those commands. So basically, all, all I just showed you was we were sending this specially formatted URL with some variables in it. So variable one was phrase one, and the other variable was phrase two. So, any question? That is a great question. So there happens to be documentation for the API on the web page. That is very standard. So a web page offering an API will typically have the documentation hosted on that same web page. That's, that's the normal practice. Um, now, the, the, the variation is in how good of documentation is there for that API. Typically, it's very poor. This one is, it gives you examples. It's simple to use. It does one thing. All good, nice design. All right. So now, um, this is a, a function that I sort of pulled together that sends variables in a URL using the request library in Python. So I typically wouldn't want to invest. This, this is a lot of effort, right? No joke. That's a couple lines of Python, reasonable amount of effort. And so I typically wouldn't want to do that if I just care about how close is Ben and Pain or Cat and Dog. Right, but let's say I have a whole you know, 10,000 words, and I want to find what all of the you know, similarity rankings are between all the pairs. That's a lot of computation. So it would make a lot of sense to take that big list of words and then do all the pairs, running them through a loop, and making API calls. Right? That would be a lot more efficient. So I need a way to have that URL called for an arbitrary set of input variables. So this is where the exciting part comes in. You can do that in Python. right? So I've got a function called sim for similarity. I pass in two words and then a couple other variables for relation and web base. And this is my base URL. That's the every um, API call is going to start with that. And basically, all I'm doing is I'm constructing a dictionary of key and values with these variables in them. And then the request library takes your dictionary and formats it into the appropriate URL to send to the web page, and then also handles your, your response. That's really candy, right? Like, that's good stuff that you don't have to redo. Imagine, like, if I gave you the homework task of, please do that in Python, you'd be like, mm, no, no, no. <laughs> So let's run this notebook. All right. So again, we can just put in an arbitrary um, set of words here. I reuse bike and car. And then there are other corpuses. So there's, uh, a, yeah, good question. So a corpus is a different set of documents, basically. So in this case, it's a different set of words. So and why they have a different corpus in there, I don't have any good insight on that. But they just listed it. There are other variables that you can send variations on. So the point there is there are some arguments that are required to their API and some arguments that are optional. So for instance, the default corpus that I'm using is web-based. Maybe I want to send a, a different set of rankings, and that's gigawords. So the details of this API uh, in terms of sending the URL, that's the part I wanted to focus on. I actually don't care about like what the API does. Not, not a purpose. So my, my hope in getting this to you is that if you see an API and you want to manipulate the input variables, it's always basically the same structure. No. <laughs> <laughs> A reasonable question. All right. Yes. All right. So I just showed you uh, APIs. Um, they're not the only path that you can go down for getting data. Um, so this is a, a little story that I was looking on the Social Security Administration website for a list of baby names. All right. So this web page has a list of baby names. I was like, great, I'll just scrape it. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I was about to go down that path, um, and then I looked at the robust at TXD. And it's like, mm, OK. I mean, not that I'm afraid of the Social Security Administration, but it's just sort of like, maybe they're nice and they have other ways of doing it. So I looked at their website policy. Oops, sorry. And I read about that. Um, and then through extensive reading on the Social Security Administration website and searching Google about how to download files from them, 
um, it turns out that they have um, data sets that you can just download. So this is another avenue to think about. Um, some organizations are intended, they're created to share data. And so those are good places to get data from. So Social Security Administration posts their content, like your big databases, on the internet for you to download. That means you don't have to scrape it, and right? you don't have to use their API. It's just a big old CSV. That's super handy. All right, so this, this was way easier once I figured that out. So <laughs> that was the comparison of like scraping APIs and how to, uh, how to get data. Oh, not to don't worry about that. One more API that I just, I just found this uh, actually, I think yesterday. I just wanted to throw it in. So this is another example of less well-documented APIs. So this is UMBC's event feeds. All the things that show up for groups are API uh, exposed. And so you should be able to type in the group name and like get back all the content as XML. Now, if you've not worked with XML, that's a good thing. Avoid it. I mean, like, it exists, um, and it, it is a normal way of conveying information from APIs, but uh, we'll probably not go down that rabbit hole. Okay. That was just an example of the data is available through an API. I was sort of surprised. I'll work that in next semester. All right, we'll take a break, and we'll come back. Let's see. About five minutes, six minutes. 54, and then we'll get into an activity. <laughs> Pulling through the rifle. <laughs> I like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Actually, the I will verify that. But the, so the visualization and data cleaning for project one we will cover before that is due. Did I have pardon? I 
Okay, so I think everybody's back, uh, almost. Uh, yeah, I got everybody. All right. So, so far, I've primarily focused on the sort of electronic methods of getting data back. Um, so that's not typically how I spend most of my time. I've worked in the government for about eight years. Of that time, the number of the number of times I could actually get data electronic was very, very small in comparison to the more normal way that I get data, which is by talking to people. And like Ben, that's super weird. Like you're a data scientist. Why do you have to talk to people? It's because of a lot of technical issues, but also because of political issues. So who here has worked for a large organization? people okay so you can hopefully validate my claim that there's a lot of politics in large organizations yeah okay so <laughs> that's a major component for small organizations personalities also matter but typically small organizations are less likely to hire a data scientist like unless you're working on a company that is doing data science for other people then you'll have customers who are going to be playing politics with you, but less likely. So for large organizations, they're hiring data scientists. You'll be working with other teams who are not composed of data scientists to get the data from. So it's sort of like the reality. The challenge is the data science team isn't usually the one making the money. So you don't have the power. Right? People in the business who make the money are the people who have the power. That's the people who are uh, selling the product right, or designing it. Um, if they're talking with their customers. So you're not the profit generator because you don't have the power. And you're not the people generating the data. Right? You're typically not, if you're working for like a, a, a business which is making things, that 
organization that's making the things is generating the data about making the things. So they own the data. You don't get to. Um, so that means you have a couple of stakeholders to convince, right? You have to convince your management that you won't disrupt the politics by going and talking to these other teams. And then when you go talk to these other teams, you have to convince them that you're going to add value to their experience. What does that really mean? Well, it either means you're going to make them more profit or you're going to get that person who owns the data promoted. And those are the two ways that you can really leverage your way into a conversation. Right? If someone sees you coming in and says, this data scientist, A, doesn't know what they're talking about, is just going to waste my time and probably even like cause some problems with like the privacy of the data and like they're going to do the analysis wrong, right? These are the dangers and the risks that you as a data scientist present. Right? You're going to take up their time, decrease their ability to make profit, distract them from the real business that they're in, right? And like you have to convince them that, yeah, I am experienced. I am coming in with some skills. I can help you make more profit or get promoted. Those are the things that people hear. So it is nice to be, it is good to be nice, but it's typically not the way that you demonstrate value. All right, so, um, and then the other aspect that I, I spend almost all of my time in, talking to people in the language that they understand. So if you're a data scientist and you say, Python, Jupyter, beautiful soup, request, right? Yeah, it sort of demonstrates that you have some technical skill, but I have no idea what that is, right? So what you really want to learn how to do is talk to someone in the language that they're comfortable in, which depends on their domain, right? If they're uh, like a, con uh, a lawyer or uh, a project manager, right, or uh, a line person working on some product, right, maybe a design engineer, you have to speak in terms that they understand while also convincing them that you offer some differential value, that you're more than just sort of like learning from them. You're actually going to provide them some value. So this is a real challenge of learning what language they speak, learning to be fluent in that language, and convincing them that you're special and valuable. Right, that's, that's where most of my time is spent, not writing Python. Okay. All right, so you all have these sheets. I've handed them out to you. Um, you're going to basically pair up with someone who doesn't have the role that you're in. Right? So there's basically two roles. One role is the people who own the data, and the other group is the people who want the data. That's you, the scientists, right? So the other people are not playing data scientists, they're playing data owners. So now we'll split in the two different sections. So on this side, what do we, what do we have over here? Data owners are going to cluster over here, and the data requesters are going to cluster over here. So we're going to inspire, right? The data requesters, you're going to inspire on how to get that data. If you close your ears, these guys are going to protect the data. Right? Don't let your requesters get that data. No. <laughs> Good See, practice. So, it's a lot of so, so you guys understand your motives of why you want to protect that data. Right? It's a distraction for the business. There's a risk, right? That they're going to lose it. They're going to screw it up. And they're going to expand the data space on it. They're going to lose your reputation. These are the reasons not to give up your data. Okay. <laughs> All right, you guys understand your role. You want to get that data. You have skills. You have experience. You want to leverage that. You want to convince them that you're a worthy person to get that data. You're going to treat that data right and add value back to them by right? handling it all safely. Okay. Just with the okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're and giving you some tips on how to get that data. Okay. That's it. You guys got the fence. <laughs> Okay. Everybody's good? <laughs> I'm just seeing if everybody's reading. If you're reading, that's good. I'm fine. Okay. Once you read over your sheet, pair up with someone who doesn't have your role. So data requesters find the data owner. Data owner find a requester. Or don't make yourself available. Hi. <laughs> Just saying. Right? Okay. Pair up. Find your partner. 
Food bribes are totally a thing. I bring in donuts all the time. <laughs> you missed that opportunity, but I'm saying it's a thing. <laughs> okay, find a partner and talk. I will be wandering on. If you don't have a partner, find me. You can spread out across the entire room. You have lots of space.
Okay, let's come back to our desk. <laughs> This is like your conversation. Come back. So one trick that I had in the title was the data owner typically has some emotional basis that they're operating from. They're either fearing something or they are desiring of something. They have some hope. And if you as the data requester can figure that out, that's the entry point. Right? It's not just a providing value. There's some emotional basis they're reasoning from. The other aspect that I would say is when you get into a situation where someone will simply not give you the data, Right? That is a very normal response. As this is, by the way, semester over semester, this is normal. Right? <laughs> Most people don't give up their data. That's reasonable. So the, the 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 tip is, there's a couple different directions you can go. You can go above that person to their manager, make that argument. You can have your manager talk to their manager. Right? You can find someone else in that same organization. You can go around them. Right? Or you can do an activity. Um, that I'm going to show at the end of class called fake data. And I'll get into why fake data is a great thing. Okay. Now, the, the major tip with the fake data is you can demonstrate to someone that you do actually have the skills without actually having the real data. That's, that's the primary point. We'll get into what that means. Right. So, last method of getting data from documents. This is a couple of notebooks that I'm going to step through, and then we're going to go through an activity where you're doing that thing. So that's my incentive for you to pay attention. All right. So as I said, um, there's lots of different places you'll find data. If you're working in an organization, typically that organization has the data that it needs. Right? And so that means that there may be reports, PowerPoints, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets. Those are the normal operating tools of any business. As a data scientist, know how to get content out of all of those. And if you think of, well, is there a Python program that reads PowerPoints? Yes, there is. That's handy, right? So, like, if I if I show up and I've got, you know, this is the past ten years of our weekly reports in a PowerPoint. You'd be like, I don't know what to do with that, right? You you take all the content out of there with Python. Right? That's the trick. So let's look. Oh, lastly. So, so this is so. No. <laughs> so the idea of lossless is conversion is um, there's some content in one document format, and you want to convert it into another document format. Sometimes that document conversion process can lose data, but the trick is sometimes you can convert the document to an HTML page losslessly, so you don't lose any information or structure. In which case, parsing your HTML is typically easier. All right, and uh, yeah, so let's so let's go through what I would consider a very standard approach of um, taking Word documents and PDFs and extracting text out of them. It's a very standard purpose uh, activity. I happen to have a large number of text documents with me today. So I'm gonna run this. 
right, so this, this shouldn't be too surprising. The library is called Python DOCX. Uh, DOCX is the file extension for Word. All right, so I've already got it installed. Um, I'm going to just look at, I have a folder called Essays, and that essay has a bunch of DOCX files in it. So that's the set of files I'll be taking content out of. And you'll see there's a lot of them. It'd be kind of painful to have to open up each one of these files manually and then take it out of the uh, Word document, put it in a text file. I mean, it's something, there's only probably like 20 files here, so it's, it's doable. But when you get into like the 100 or 1,000 documents, it's unreasonable to do manually. And it's very unreliable. So Python is useful. So in this notebook, I'm going to focus on extracting the document, uh, the text from one document. And in the next notebook, I'll show you just basically we're going to loop over that um, code. Yep, uh, Python DOCX. And then I imported DX from document. I'm sorry, yeah, from document import DX. OK. So I use that library called document. Um, I just say, this is the file. And then put all of the things that you find in this new variable. Really straightforward to use. The thing that it returns back in this variable is a set of paragraphs, which is sort of a natural way of par parsing a text. And so basically, this loop here is just looping over all the paragraphs that they found in the document. And then it's going to just print, like, hey, this paragraph one is here, and paragraph two is here. So you can sort of see, if you read through this, this is someone's essay in a DOCX format. And it's just putting out each paragraph. Whether or not you need to retain those paragraphs for purposes of analysis, it's sort of um, that's a, a detail, but that's basically pretty straightforward, right? So now we'll take the skill that we learned there for one document and basically put that inside of a loop. And right, so we're going to take the same code that we just wrote in the other notebook, put in a function. We're passing the name of the file, and then we're going to put it inside of a loop. So this is our loop where we take uh, the OS, which is a live Python module, and then we list the contents of that directory. If the file name ends with DOCX or DOC, just take all those files. That's the list of files we're going to operate on. So now we've got a function and a list, uh, sorry, a function and a loop. And we'll put the function call inside the loop so that it operates on each one of those um, files as an argument. And then we're going to store the results. So this is, so this is, right, we're calling the, the document, and then we're going to put that content into a dictionary, right, where the key of the dictionary is the file name that we took the content from. But it just happens to be a convenient choice of data structure. We're going to take a list of DOCX files, transform it into a dictionary where each of the keys is the file name. So far, so good questions on that? Hmm? Did not? OK, so good. If, if nobody's getting this, then we should definitely roll back and see what's up. Where did I lose people? All right. <laughs> All right. So, so we've got a list of files. So far, so good. All right. We're going to read the content of one file. That is now a variable. Now we're going to access the contents of that variable and see what's in it. It happens to be for this library, the thing that gets returned is a set of paragraphs. These paragraphs can be accessed. I'm going to loop over them as a list. All right, so paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three. And you just see what that looks like. So for one of the paragraphs in that list of paragraphs from the document, I'm going to index, um, right, put a counter in there, basically, and say, if that paragraph has a length greater than zero, then I will print the, con the paragraph number and the paragraph text. Were we lost on this part? No. OK, good. So we're going to, so the way that I sort of walk through my tutorials is I want to say, I do some exploration, then I take that knowledge that I gained and I put it into a function that I can call elsewhere. So I'm not advocating that you 
walk through this set of notebooks exactly the way that I do if you were to do this task, you'd typically develop one notebook with all of your sort of exploration and productization in one sequence. But I separate out these notebooks so that I can see like, this is a concept. This next notebook is a different concept. Next concept in a different notebook. So that's, that's my teaching method for notebooks. Okay, so this notebook, we're taking what we learned, which was how to extract the text from a document, and now get it from all the documents in that directory. Remember, there were like 20 documents. So now we have to run that same concept, but against a list of all the pages. All right. So, so first we took the thing that we learned in the previous notebook, and we put it in a function. Are we good with that or no? No? Yes. Okay. We have yes. So we're taking the name of the file that we're going to extract the content from, and we're doing that same loop over paragraphs, and we're storing that text. All right. So if, if we're not comfortable with that, let's, let's use this function against a file and see what happens. I'm just going to store, pick that. And we'll throw that in there. No, that's not what I like. All right, sorry. All right, not the I'm reconstructing code of the files. So the this fun so I take a document, let's look it up now. So we took the, the concept there that we learned previously, getting all these paragraphs, and we put it in a function. The function is taking our document variable, the thing that contains all the the output from the document library, and it's splitting those up by paragraphs. So we're, we're still good on that, okay? So then the question is, well, what did we get back from that? And so here, when, when I return a variable from a function and I don't store it to something, that gets printed to the output. Make sense? So, so here, normally I would say like, output uh, variable. When I do that, the content from this function gets stored in a variable. But if I don't do that, I, I typically just want to see what the content of that variable is. It's like a quick way. Now, the al alternative way is if I wanted to say, uh, if I do want to store that variable, and then I can just type it in there and it'll also display. It's actually we're good. Right. I'm trying to figure out where you guys are not happy. All right. So I get back this huge list of paragraphs from the document parsing. Now, once I've got that, I want to loop over all of my files and store, do the operation on each of the files. So this is, this is the loop that I constructed of how to do the looping over files thing. So if I run that, let's see. Did I get stuck? Yeah. OK, so when I run that, I'm just going over all of the file entries in the directory and checking what is their file name end with. If it ends with the thing that I care about, then I'm interested in that file. Okay, questions on that? We're good. I'm, I'm going over this slowly because you're going to do this. So I want to make sure that nobody's lost. Huh? Yeah, okay. Let's, let's go in there. All right. We'll go up the directory, actually. So this is a, so I should maybe explain. I have a directory here called essays. And I'm listing the contents of that directory. Right. I have to import that module at the top. Always OS? That is a library, yes. What is OS for? It's to access commands from your operating system through Python. 
So here I'm just listing the contents of a directory. So I've got, and basically notice here I've got a bunch of text files for the purposes of getting the contents out of DOS files. I don't care about them. Right? So now I have this list. I have to figure out which of these entries are actually DOCX files or DOC files. And then once I've got that, I'm going to uh, have to specify. So let's. So what I really want is the full path of what directory and what files there are. And so I have to join the file name, which is this DOCX thing, along with the directory that it's in. So this is the OS path join command. Right, so it's taking two arguments. The first argument is the directory, and the second argument is the file name. And then the output of that is this path to the file. I'm getting some squinty eyes. So let's let me find this quickly here. Let's see, this is my version control. So this is in now. Now I'm over in the browser, the the file browser for Mac. I'm going to show you what I'm actually seeing in the file browser. So there's an actual directory called essays. And if I go in there, it's all these files. Right? So I needed some way in Python to do that. Okay. So what I get back from that loop is a list of all of the essay folder contents that have DOCX in the file. All right. Now we got some head nods. All right. Right, now I can combine the function that I wrote with the loop that I'm doing. So I can execute that, uh, that function against every element in the list that gets produced in the loop. So that's the, that's the powerful part. Right? This is important because if I have a thousand files, I don't want to have to manually run that function against each thing in the list. Right? I actually want to just hit it every time in the list um, automatically. So that's why I'm putting this function call inside the list. Yeah. Okay. So I get back a path, and then I have to run the document library against that, and then I have to extract out all the paragraphs from that. Right. And I store the results in a dictionary. So this this dictionary is the fancy part here, where we're taking the key to be the like essays week two summary .docx. That's the key, and the uh, the result here is the content from that paragraphs function. Okay. Huh? Yep. Yes. Uh, well, it's actually a dictionary, but yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to rerun this notebook so we can see the final result of this at the end. So that list of keys down here at the bottom. This is a little bit difficult to read, but basically it's every single entry with SA and the name of the file as a list of the keys. And if we take one of those keys and we say, what is the content? Well, it's that dictionary of paragraphs that we found initially. Okay. Lots of, so now is anyone confused? We got, <laughs> all right. This was important because we're gonna do it again for PDFs and PDFs are way messier. <laughs> I love the groans. All right. Yes. So, so parsing PDFs are painful, but recognize that that's how most people publish reports. So that's where most of your data will come from, right? Very rarely will you get something in a DOCX file, unless it's internally generated and someone's happy to share the data with you. They'll email you a DOCX file, but more likely you'll get a PDF. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so, so you'll typically want to manipulate the data in something other than its native format, like a DOCX file or PDF. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Akal, any questions? No? Good. Anyone else? All right. I just, so if someone has some conversation pairwise, I typically want to intercede there and see, like, does anyone else know? Like, what's the question, right? Like, so I'm not just asking to be a jerk. I'm just, 
<laughs> I legitimately want to know what's the question. Okay. So here's the, the first heads up on, on PDFs. For like Python VOCX, that was one library. It's very easy to use. It's pretty straightforward. Um, PDFs, there's a ton of different libraries. And you're like, wow, that's, that's really strange that people would duplicate effort like that. And, and it turns out they don't duplicate effort, is that there's a lot of different ways to slice up a PDF. So I think of, P, so you may think of a PDF as just like a flat thing that contains some text and images. You know, and it's like a little, you can't edit it usually. Um, so that's the typical way people think about PDFs. But if you've ever seen a PDF that you can sort of like fill out a form in, right? Maybe you, your work is a fancy workplace and you can sign PDFs with a digital signature. You can embed movies. You can have active content in there like dynamic web pages in a, in a, in a PDF document. These are really multimedia containers. That introduces a lot of complexity when all I want to do is take out the text, right? But it means that the way that you access the PDF, it's very complicated. So all these different libraries have different ways of entering into that multimedia container, basically. So, uh, and, and now I've listed out a bunch of them. I didn't get four of them to work, so happily two was sufficient. <laughs> um, right, and I only have two PDFs, and I still couldn't get it to work. So. Um, I'm just going to, so again, in this notebook, I'm going to tackle one PDF, and then the next notebook I'm going to show you, I'm going to loop over that list of PDFs, so there's two of them, and then do the same thing. So we'll see how that goes. Um, again, I'm just going to walk through these libraries. Pi to PDF is the one that I turned out to work pretty well most of the time. Um, so I, I install Pi to uh, Pi PDF2, and then you've got this huge block of code here. And this is just for me reading documentation. This isn't like some magical skill set, right? So I'm opening a file, I'm saving the output of that file handle to a variable, and I'm calling the library uh, against the, that file handle, and I'm storing the output of that to a variable. So this is just normal operations that you'll do with any parser. Uh, read binary. And then, so the way that you access content in the variable that was returned from the library is you get the number of pages, and then you have to basically page through the PDF. And so we have to loop over the pages in the PDF. Here there's one page. Um, and so when I print the content of that PDF page, this is what I get. And you're like, ah, oh, that looks disgusting. Right? It's got like these weird characters like XC3, X91, like interspersed with some of the content I care about. And then it's got these line breaks, slash M, that's a line break. Right? Um, and then so then even has this weird thing like access to September 6, 2018. Like, there's just stuff in there that's just like, I don't need that. And it's probably what the content creator intended to provide anyways. So yeah, PDFs, um, they have a bunch of hidden information. They're very uh, noisy and hard to work with. But they're most of what your data will be. OK, another library. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> it will. So, so what I was trying to get across is that this is one output produced by one PDF library. We're going to look at two other libraries and see what those output. They'll be different. OK. So key features to remember here, they've got these XC, X91 things. Don't know what those are. We're going to ignore them for now. Let's try a different library and see if it works better. So here's another library. This one is sort of cool. What it does is instead of trying to like manipulate Python variables, it just converts your PDF into a text file. So it's like a very simple command. And then your Python task is to read the text file, which is very different, right? So you'll notice here, um, there's still some like weird variable stuff going on here, like x0c at the end of it. So you'll notice um, it's still got that access content. Um, but some of those other characters that were present in the other one are not present here. No, it's just that there are different entry points on how programs access PDFs. So best choice is to try a bunch of different ones. Now, here's a fun, fun little character. So J-E-F-F. -F. It clearly understood that this was a Jeff, right? But it's treating that F-F -F as a special character, not two characters, right? Which, if you look back up here, I believe that that wasn't present. Uh, where is Jeff? On that. This one? Yeah, so so how the characters get interpreted, it depends on the library. So 
and all of these are tunable with just and then here's okay. This one is the worst. Um but I was able to get work. The other one I didn't even show work. The PDF RW stands for PDF read write. It's another library. Same idea. So we're just passing it the file name that we've stored already up at the top of the notebook. And then it gets us back these keys. So it actually returns a dictionary of keys from the document. And so we look at the top level keys. And this dictionary contains four keys, size, root, info, and ID, with a leading slash. So let's look at the value of one of those keys. So it has scraped out the header from the PDF. You can sort of think of like a header as the same thing that you see in the HTML page, but way more complicated, with way different information. So it turns out that this key was produced on a Mac um, and we don't know who the author is, and it has a title in the document. Like, is that useful? Probably not for our purposes if we're just scraping data. But it turns out if you want to go low level into the PDF, there are libraries that do that. And that's what we're looking at here. So again, we can just sort of like crawl down into this dictionary, looking at all the keys, nesting into them, and then, you know, basically you're spending all your time hunting for which of these nested keys has the actual content I care about. It, it's, it's, Sometimes that's what you want. Like maybe there's a hidden video in there I extract out, but you know, like you know, here we're just here for the text, so I'm not gonna use this library. No, no, no. So keys is the way that you access a dictionary. Uh, so it's getting a list of the dictionary elements. And here we have uh, so this top level thing is a dictionary. I'll actually show that. So let's look at type X. Mm -hmm. uh, is not one. Yeah. So we'll look at the type, and it's uh, probably a dictionary. Uh, that runs. All right. So that's all. I'm gonna skip ahead here. So the next uh, notebook is basically the same idea that we just looked at. We're gonna wrap up the knowledge that we learned into a function, and then loop over a set of files. Okay. So I've got a trick up my sleeve. A new library you may not have seen called Glob. This is a super handy library. I highly recommend it. So remember, previously, we had this pretty complicated set of if statements and print statements and for loops to get us a list of the files with the file name extension. That's cool if you want to do a bunch of work, but I'm against doing a bunch of work. I'm super lazy. So Glob is, makes life nice. You just pass it the directory and uh, a star for a wildcard and the file extension, and it gives you back a list. That's all it does, right? That's way easier. All right. So now I'm going to take all that code that I used previously um, on the other notebook. And then when I call that against one of my PDFs, I get back something that's totally unexpected. That's not what I wanted at all, right? So remember, there were, there were only two PDFs in this directory. And I wanted to parse them, so I developed all this code based around which PDF? Let's see here. So I chose Essays Week Assignment Summary PDF. And that happens to be that for that PDF, the libraries that I tested out seemed to work. So I was happy, and I proceeded with that. And then I applied that function to the other PDF, and it broke. It didn't get the content I wanted. So I was like, phew, good thing I tried all those other PDF libraries. Because <laughs> when I go off and try those, it turns out they do work. All right, so that's a good, a good thing. So that means when I loop over all my files, what I really want to do is use the PDF that works against most of the PDF, or sort of the, the library that works against most of the PDFs. So in this case, I found one library that does happen to work against both PDFs. That's convenient. Because it might be the case that you have a PDF that works with one library, another PDF that only works with this other library, and it gets very complicated. So it's nice to find a resilient PDF library. Sorry? They, they, so they were probably created on different computers by different PDF creating libraries. So like you may have Acrobat Reader, maybe you uh, saved your web page as a PDF, right? That was created by Firefox. You know, so there's lots of different programs that can create PDFs. And so that means that the document format is all over the place. Like your Word, your Microsoft Word documents, how many programs create that? One. 
Life's easy, right? PDFs, lots of programs create those. Okay, so that's how we got the text uh, the text out of the PDF. Now let's see where we do some work. All right. So, oh yeah, I have a random pairing. Let's see where that is. I have to go over to uh, desktop. And see. I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna do this activity, and we're gonna run a little over tonight. Uh, trying to do all. There you go. Yes. So we're gonna we're gonna get paired up, and again, rather than you trying to find someone, we're gonna uh, get you random par randomly paired up. Okay, Oops. I just go over there. I go to figure out where I am. Select random students. There we go. All right. So I have a list of names. That's all you. And I'm gonna create. I'm gonna use this uh, random library in Python. And if I run random dot choice against that list, I'll get back a name. All right. So let's run that. This is just to show you random choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I picked out someone else. That's neither here nor there for the purpose of this lesson. But I have another cell where I define a thing that removes an element from the list. And so I'm going to loop over that list of students. I'm going to pick out two students and make them a pair. And then go back to the list and try it again and again and again. And create a list of pairs. So these are who you'll be working with. Hmm? <laughs> So find your partner. One of you should have a functional computer. Yes? Yeah. It should be relatively quickly. We'll see. We'll spend five ten minutes and see where it goes. All right. So in Blackboard, you should have access to some data. You'll need to download the data and extract it out of the zip file and create a notebook. We'll spend five minutes and see how far you get. If you don't finish this out, it's not a requirement. But the goal is basically to do the same thing for text files that we just did in class. Okay. 
see. Right, glob. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I'd say the to get you quickly started the the glob command glob dot glob and then in the directory where you are and find the file that's probably like a big tip. <laughs> Like if you're going to use Bob, then you have to use it. Oh, uh, the, the exclamation, the exclamation is the thing that allows you to get back to your computer, so then money can so then, so then escape from the job. Okay. 
So in order to get us out of here a little bit late, I will speed ahead. Um, so that the command, I'll just show you some commands that I think will be useful. Um, and these will be available, sorry, in the uh, in the video. So I don't have the files, but I would import glob and then glob, uh, sorry, list of files, glob.glob. So what this will give me back is a list of all the text files. So if I look at that, oh, now it's empty. But so this is how I'm going to get my list of files. And then once I have that, I want to loop over for this file in the list of files uh, with open uh, let's see. this file read. Okay, so I haven't compiled this. It doesn't necessarily run, but this is the quick answer to the problem. Right? So we're going to get the list of files. Once we've got that list of files, then we're going to create a new dictionary to store my results in. We're going to loop over all the file entries, and then we're going to open each file, get the contents of that text file. Text files are easy, right? And then we're going to take that file content and store it into my dictionary with the key being the file name. Okay, so a lot of people ran into complexities. If you have questions, the video CX and PDF files will be posted, but I would definitely recommend tackling this problem on your own. If this is a hard problem for you, work on it. That's my recommendation. And I'll try and use up the last five minute homework, which is uh, exciting to, to think about. All right, so you can stay in your seats. We'll just talk a little bit about the fake data. Um, so basically, what I, what I mentioned earlier was the fake data is a useful concept when someone doesn't believe that you actually have skills. Yeah. Right? So let's say that I'm going to work with someone who has a list of names and addresses and phone numbers. And they're like, Ben, I'd give this to you, but it was, you know, it's very sensitive information, and I, I just don't know that you're going to be capable of handling it. So what you can go do is go back to your office, write up a list of names and phone numbers and addresses, show that you can do with that fake information the thing that you claim you can do right so you can demonstrate skill and value before even having data that's really powerful people don't expect that when they when they learn of that they're just like oh i can do things without even having information to do it on right by making up information the trick is to have some concept of what you think your target data looks like if you know its names and addresses and phone numbers everyone here knows what those are structured like 
So it's relatively straightforward to make up fake data that looks like what you'd expect real data to look like. Obviously, real data is more complicated. It has errors and mistakes and nonsense in it. But for our fake data purposes, um, we sort of have to have some mental model of what the, the, the data should look like, and then we'll make data look like it. Questions on that? OK, so there's so some great websites. So again, I'm super lazy. I didn't want to actually make fake data. Like, I know what a phone number looks like, but it doesn't mean I have to type Python for it. All right, so there's this great website, which I'll hopefully pull up on the screen. And basically, it like, tells you, OK, I'm going to have uh, four rows of data, uh, four columns, sorry. And uh, let's make some phone numbers um, that are for the UK. And they look like that, right? And then you just like generate all these different things. You type it in, uh, I think you, what do you press? You press generate. And you can say, I want a CSV, right, with a comma delimited. And it's a magic, right? I mean, like, it's, it's fantastic. I don't even have to work that hard. I just go to a web page, generate some fake data. Then I can write a notebook that makes transformations to it and show my customer this is what I could do if you gave me that real data. All right, got one cool. Right. <laughs> it's my life, so I just have to say it's pretty cool. Right, so there's all these. So you can do with visualizations. You don't have to worry about the sort of cleanliness of the data because it's fake. Right, you know that um, you can have some variations in it. You can split that in. You can make reports that are generated that look like what a report would look like. So all of these great benefits, really worth time. Okay, so how do we do that? Right, I showed you one notebook where. We have a list of all the students, and we pulled a random student from there, right? So I could have a list of fake names, fake baby names, maybe from the Social Security Administration. Right? It doesn't matter. You just make things up. Okay. And then, uh, so maybe you pick something from there. Maybe you can construct a random phone number, right? A random phone number is pretty straightforward. You just have three random digits, a dash, and then four more random digits. That's a phone number. Okay, addresses, they're obviously a little more complicated. They have some numbers, some 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 text in it, and then maybe some more commas and more text. Maybe a list of states would be useful. Okay, we covered that. Right. Huh. All this is coming together. All right. So then in the end of US space, we want to create a data structure that contains all those elements. All right. So homework. I think I'm gonna <laughs> I'm at 13 minutes, I realize, but um, the task is to create some fake data using the things that you learned in this class. Amazing. All right. So this is a reasonably complicated homework. And, and I'm giving you one assignment, but I think it will take more time than the time you've invested on your previous assignments. So just heads up. It's hard to do well. Um, so I'm asking for a bunch of things. That's usually not the part that um, trips people up. Each of like you know what an email address looks like. I don't have I have faith in you for that part. The hard part is like constructing a CSV with all these columns. Right. So and I realize there's a ton of different ways to do this. Everyone will hopefully submit slightly different homeworks. I'm totally cool with that. That's the goal. Okay, questions so far? <laughs> I love your laziness. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I'm actually not looking for your CSV. And I'm looking for the code that generates the CSV of arbitrary length. Right. <laughs> so is it a thousand lines or ten thousand lines? Well, that's something that I, Ben, get to choose. Right. When I look at your notebook, that's an input. So the that web page won't help you with this assignment, in my opinion. But if you can figure out how to leverage that web page, I'll be impressed. <laughs> I I showed you that that web page, you know, knowing that this was the homework. <laughs> we need to create all these fields. Yes. And we need using, to write all these data into a field. Yes. Okay. And we have to create all these fields using Python. Uh, that is one way of doing it. So basically, we have to create data. Yes. So, but we can create data using the data. I can randomly type for specify or an Excel sheet. It wouldn't be realistic, right? Huh? But what we have what to actually do. Actually do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you're getting a little ahead, but um, like how many rows of the CSV should there be? Like, uh, yeah. Okay. I did not specify how realistic it is. Right. <laughs> I leave myself some subjective room in the grading rubric to say, like, you can do the assignment right, and it wouldn't be that right. right? But, like, if you just have random characters to your entire CSV, you might not get a hundred percent. It's a little subjective. Right? So. 
So Ben is a realistic name in my opinion. I'm a little biased. Um, the name MXQNFASFS right, is less realistic. And I'm not saying that it has to be perfect for all the names, but you know, make a little effort. Right? That's all I'm asking. So I know that you can generate random strings. I don't doubt that. I'm asking for a little bit of realism. Yeah. Um, so because we're a little, yeah, go ahead. Question. Right. So the so the earlier question was, do we have to write Python to generate all the data? No. Right. Like if I got a list of the states, I could put that in my addresses. I wouldn't have to make up states. I got a list of baby names. I don't have to make up the list of names. I don't need to write any random thing. Just just collect whatever you can. Again, that would be a potential approach. Okay. Right. Like which one of those is less work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So what you're starting with basically is a function that looks like this, right? A file name, the number of entities that I, that you want to generate, right? And then it returns nothing. And so the challenge is to fill out the content of that function. Right? So there's nothing returned because you're going to generate a file. If you do use input files, please include those so that I can run your notebook. Does that make sense? Okay. And in the end, so this is like a design tip for you, and I really apologize for giving you like, you're going to, I would suggest, I would advocate writing what your CSV looks like before you go and code it. So, so this is a, a heads up. We may, in the future classes, be using the CSVs that you generate from this notebook. So if you put out a, note, a notebook that produces wrong CSVs, you've just made your life harder. How much data? How much data? Good question. Uh, uh, so I'm going to refer to this. So I, I'm intentionally including this because this is part of like the, the responses, right? Um, I'm not asking for a certain number of rows. Uh, this is an arbitrary input. Remember? Uh, so that was another answer. Uh, right. So, so when you say duplicates, like I could have two names in my list of random names, uh -huh. and like a thousand entities wouldn't be very random. But, yeah. So, you know, how realistic is the fake data is the question. Now. So, like some reasonable number of, like if I have two addresses and two numbers and two names, then if I generate ten thousand, I'll have a bunch of duplicates. So, again, a little effort. <laughs> but as soon as you have something like 10 to 20 names, it starts becoming like high permutations because there's 10 columns or something. Right? Yeah. Okay. Question. More questions. You are free to go. I will stay here to answer questions. But thank you for staying late. I apologize for keeping you late. How do you <laughs> I would say since this class class is library. Okay, so two tips. Start early.